really delighted to have Dr. Taylor from Drexel University to give us a talk on the checklist to ensure safety. But before I introduce her, let me mention some housekeeping issues. So you know that uh, instructions to obtain CME credit are on the screen, and we can also email you the instructions if you provide your address on the sign-in sheet. Our next ID series will be February 28th, and it will be Dr. Dar Darcy Weissman from University of Delaware, and she will talk about recovery and of functional mobility after stroke. And please do not uh, forget to register through the Christian Care portal. And our March 5th Tech Talk will be Dr. Laura Balzer from University of Massachusetts, and she will talk about machine learning for causal inference. So do not miss that one. I'll be back for that. <laughs> we'll have blue jeans, so we can attend on blue jeans. So I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor is Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at Don Sife School of Public Health at Drexel. And she's also the Director of the Center for Firefighter Injury Research and Safety Trends, or FIRST. And the Director of Fire Service, Fire Service Injury Research, Epidemiology and Evaluation Fellowship. She has a PhD in Health Policy and Management, specializing in injury prevention and control from Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and an MPH from Boston University of Public Health. She also has practiced public health as a Bureau Chief of Health Statistics and Data Management in the New Hampshire Department of Health. And also, she was project director in the Department of Surveillance and Coordinated Injury Prevention in the Massachusetts Department of Health. She's a very active teacher and mentor, has won multiple awards and honors, such as multiple outstanding mentor teaching excellence. And she's currently the PI on several grants from NIH, NIM, HD, Global Alliance for Training in Health Equity Research, and grants from FEMA, and has also been a PI on numerous FEMA grants. She has a long list of peer-reviewed publications and also disseminates her work through publications in national newspaper, website, radio, in TV interviews. That's very impressive. So I'm delighted. And she speaks also very good French. <laughs> Thank you so much. So good afternoon to everyone here and everyone out there in La La Land. I am going to work to remotes because my notes are on one computer and the presentation is here. So if I don't flip a slide, say something. Okay. Okay. Ah, going backwards. Okay. I have nothing to disclose of any part of my life. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I have financial relationships, but none that need to be declared here. So. so when we think about innovation, and uh, thank you for the kind invitation to be here, you may wonder why the director of a firefighter injury research center is here talking to people who are engaged in healthcare. And while you might think the fire service takes one road and healthcare takes another, in, oh, sorry, hang with me. There's actually an intersection of your industries where you have a lot in common. So in the United States Fire Service, comparing paramedics who do EMS response to all workers, they have a two-fold higher fatality rate and a five-fold higher non-fatal injury rate. Um, this is a video that I want to share. Wanna, mm -hmm, sorry, I'm working a lot of things here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Does anybody know how I might get the, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm learning the, uh... okay. Anyway, um, this is a, a video of my colleague, Kelly Adams from the Detroit Fire Department. She was going to a normal EMS run to a homeless shelter 
for a patient who was complaining of pain in the ankle. And um, when she got there with her partner, there was a bystander who attacked her with a box cutter and gave her what's called the Jekyll cut, what they call in prison, where um, she received a cut from her temple to her jaw, which um, paralyzed her the entire left-hand side of her face. And I have it on my computer, and maybe it's best that I'm not sharing it uh, publicly, but if you can see this image, and I'm sorry if it's disturbing while you're eating, but that is her face after he assaulted her. And the reason I show this image is because in healthcare facilities, these types of events can happen as well, where a patient may have a patient may have a weapon on them or something that you use to provide patient care may become weaponized, like scissors that you use to cut gauze or an oxygen bottle or a syringe. And these are just the injuries we can see that help in, that happen during healthcare. Oh, I'm getting it. Okay. So in hospital workers, about 10% of the injuries you experience are due to violence. Now, I know a lot about reporting of data because I'm a geek, as we've discussed earlier, and I can tell you that for any occupational injury or disease, underreporting is rampant. And especially when it comes to violence, underreporting is rampant in your industry and in the fire and rescue service industry because of shame or being blamed for your injury, which is common in the history of this country to blame workers for their injuries, or feeling like people will think you are less of a provider, or being embarrassed because some old lady cocked you in the eye and broke your orbital bone, and you're a 25-year-old strapping physician or firefighter, or because you think that the organization won't back you up when you report and say that the violence I'm experiencing at work is causing me to have mental health sequelae. We also know in your industry, when we look at physicians and nurses and nurses assistants, these are physician injuries from violence here at the bottom. This is the average for all healthcare personnel. Excuse me, these, these are, mm -hmm, where am I going? That's the average. These are your nurses and these are your nursing assistants. So there's a locus of control issue here in violence that the person who spends the most time with the patient or is closest to the patient or doing intimate work with the patient has a greater risk. Now, I come from the nursing environment and I know a little bit about uh, the impact of, of what happens in nursing. And we know that on average, just a worker's compensation claim for injury in hospital workers is expensive. We know that a, a, a healthy percentage of nurses do not report and they might use sick time instead of actually reporting a work-related injury. We also know that when there's higher pace of satisfaction, you will find that nurses uh, have lower burnouts and we don't wanna burn out our workforce or have them unengaged with the work because it is very expensive to replace them. You might be familiar with Linda Aiken and Sean Clark's seminal work on the nursing workforce. And so for each additional patient you assign a nurse, you increase the rates of job dissatisfaction and burnout. Poor organizational culture, they have shown to be associated with needle sticks and other types of occupational injuries to workers. And early work by Linda Aiken and Sean showed that if you have needle stick injuries, you might want to look upstream at the organizational culture of your hospital to see if patients are getting harmed as well. And that's actually a lot of my work, which started in patient safety and occupational safety, that the same organizational risk factors that predispose patients to suffer from a medical error are the very same ones that cause nursing staff to have an injury on the job. Safety is a continuum. If the organizational culture at this hospital is not strong and not supportive and rewardive of worker behaviors to keep themselves safe, everyone will get injured, your patients and yourselves. Burnout is also an outcome in addition to an occupational injury. And we tend not to talk about it and we tend to silence it and internalize it. And that can make us very bad at our jobs. 
I love this quote from OSHA. I mean, how often do you get to quote OSHA in a public room? In terms of lost time case rates, it is more hazardous to work in a hospital than in construction or manufacturing. From the, patient, the National Patient Safety Foundation, the Lucian Leap Institute, workplace safety is inextricably linked to patient safety. Unless caregivers are given the protection, respect, and support they need, they are more likely to make errors, fail to follow safe practices, and not work well in teams. A little bit of theory at lunch, a little light garnish of theory. So this is Bob Karasik's job demand control model. And you work in a highly psychologically demanding environment. What this means is that you have Excessive workload can be very hard or very fast. There can be frequent interruptions of your tasks, intense concentration that's needed, and conflicting demands for your time. People who work with people have a high emotional demand in their work. So that's, that's what's up here on the top. What's here on the side is your decision latitude or the amount of control that you have in your job, the skill discretion you can employ, the decision authority you have about taking part in what happens and when, the freedom to decide how your work is accomplished. And in healthcare, as in the fire service, I'll go back and forth between the two. This is something that you're not going to be able to control. The demand for healthcare services increases, you do more with less, you have shorter lengths of stay, you have lower reimbursement, you have more chronically ill patients. This demand, the emotional demand of your work is always going to increase. This is the thing we can control. And this is the only lever we have. And this is what we're gonna be talking today. How do we actually make that happen in a healthcare organization and the United States Fire Service? If you work in a job where you have high psychological demand and low control over your job, you are what's in a high strain occupation. This leads to psychological injury and chronic disease. It also leads to work injury because you're too busy to pay attention to yourself and protocol and you're going to err. At, at least the fire alarm didn't go off. That's what happened to me in class yesterday. I'm like it, it wasn't a plant. So I am the director of the first center, as, wa as was described in my introduction. And I started out in hospitals, but I am always kicking myself, tickling myself, thinking about how similar the public safety and first responder industry is to healthcare. And indeed, there's a section <coughs> of the United States Fire Service that does mobile healthcare. That's the EMS side, emergency medical services on the ambulances. And firefighters do this as well. They do first response and they wait for an ambulance to show up. Usually they are waiting for an ambulance to show up because there aren't enough of them. So we do a lot of surveillance of these types of occupational injuries and we develop tools to look at the organizational culture around safety in the fire service. So we've developed some tools and I'll talk about those. I want to share with you the animation's not working at all. Um, what fire-based EMS responders have told us, and if you, how many people in the room are clinicians or have been clinicians? So this might be your story, right? I've been kicked, punched, bitten, spit on, you name it, I've had it all. In the state of Pennsylvania, as in about 80% of the states in the country, it is a felony to assault a first responder, which includes a healthcare worker, a police officer, firefighter, teacher, Philadelphia Parking Authority, I don't know, maybe some revision in that law needs to happen. <laughs> Professors like myself, we are a protected class in the state of Pennsylvania. But what responders have told us is, and I went to court and this is where it's disheartening because that's supposed to be a felony assault. And I'm going to court two and three times. I knew there was no confidence in the system. I mean, you shouldn't be able to do that to someone who's trying to help you. Felony assault should stick. It doesn't. There's good reasons for that. But you, when you hang out a shingle to your workforce that says, don't worry, if you get assaulted at work, someone's going to jail for five years, and that doesn't happen, 
they have a very low sense of procedural justice and faith in our systems. So here's the problem in the fire service. What we have here is 1980 and 2016. This blue line are the number of 911 calls for emergency medical services in the United States. Since 1980 to 2016, it's gone up 320%. The red line are fire calls, which have gone down 5% in that same interval. The problem is that we have not increased EMS staffing and associated resources by 320% or anything close to it. So people who are responding to your medical emergency in the field are doing more with less, and they are doing it on their backs, and they are taking on the burden of excess work. Just so you know, fun fact for a cocktail party, on average in the United States, fire departments, 60% of their work is EMS. That's the average. For the Philadelphia Fire Department where I work, where, with whom I work, it's about 80%. People don't know that this is what fire departments do in a lot of cases. And so if you are doing more with less, one would expect to see some psychological impact. And so this is a safety climate tool we developed at the first center for the fire service. It's called FOCUS, the Fire Service Organizational Culture of Safety Survey. And we asked individuals thinking about the EMS side of your work, thinking about the fire side of your work, this is a validated psychological scale called work engagement. And you can see that in red, EMS is less engaged with their work than members of the fire department who are doing fire suppression. Here, Red is bad. You can see that on the EMS side of the work, there is more burnout, more emotional exhaustion than on the fire side, although the fire side has its burnout as well. You may be familiar with safety climate instruments in healthcare, such as the Safety Attitudes Questionnaire or SAQ, or some other tools that are available from CMS. I'm not sure what's used here at Christiana. Can someone tell me? To look at the safety culture and the perceptions of the workers. The ARC, sorry, okay, thank you. So here's a couple other things that we learned from the Fire and Rescue Service. We learned about when a, a member is assaulted, there are three major themes about the patient or bystander that that falls into. What are they? What are the conditions of the patient that make them assault a responder? From my clinicians in the room, what has your experience been? What's that? Absolutely. Alcohol and drug abuse, for sure. What, another one? Right. Um, altered mental state, those, those particular types of things from an underlying mental health condition. What's the third one? It's the tricky one because it's the one you're called to do. The underlying medical condition of the patient, right? If my sugars are low and you adjust them, I might become combative. If I'm senile and I don't understand what's going on, if I'm autistic and I don't understand what's going on, those are the three major things that we've heard from EMS responders in the field that they're dealing with from patients and bystanders. These are the major categories that falls into. We've also looked at occupational role. And in the Philadelphia Fire Department, which is the center study here, paramedics had a 14-fold higher odds of being assaulted than their firefighter colleagues who do first response. So that goes back to that, that OSHA slide that I showed where certified nur nurses assistants have a higher rate of violent injury just because of that locus of control and the intimacy of the work. This last study that we did with the United States Fire Service, this is a federal report, everything's available that I'm showing you here on the first website so you can download it for free. This is a report that we did at the behest of uh, the United States Fire Administration and also the International Association of Firefighters, which is the Union of Firefighters and Paramedics in the United States and North America. And we looked at the academic literature, right? But we also looked at the industrial literature, the trade journals of the people doing this work, what they were saying about violence that they were experiencing and the stress that comes from it and what ideas and protocols they had put into place. And we found far more evidence in the industrial trade literature than in any academic publication. In fact, while the industry has been talking about this for 40 years, academics were about 20 years late to that party. So read your industrial trade journals and pay attention to what the boots on the ground are saying. And then of course, 
you've, I've read through this quote already, but this particular study is a study we did with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office to find out when they do prosecute these cases of a first responder being assaulted, what happens? What is the result? And we found that the CIS, we, we set up these laws that actually express our desire to protect everyone, but have no preventative capabilities at all. They're deterrents, but when someone is in an altered state, when someone is under the influence, when someone's medical condition makes them irrational, they no longer meet the legal status of mens rea and intent. So we set up statutes that are set to fail. So we have to do something different for people who are experiencing stress and violence at work. And so you are all familiar with checklists, right? This is how we make sure you don't kill patients. Right, And these are your clinical pathways, and these are the things when you're doing highly hazardous work or things that are very complex to make sure you don't forget, right? And Atul Gawande has written a book about the checklist manifesto, and he talks about the use of checklists in aviation and in construction and in healthcare. But checklists are about what the individual needs to do, not to mess up and not to cause harm. Who has your back as a provider? Who is making sure that you don't get hurt at work, that you don't get burnout at work? Because we know that burnout leads to poor patient outcomes, right? So we have to think about checklists in a very different way. And so we think about them at a systems level. So we brought together a group of subject matter experts from around the country, firefighters, paramedics, EMS organizations, fire service organizations, OSHA, NIOSH, CDC, scientists, all retired guys. And we got them together in a room and said, and we heard from these two people, Kelly Adams, who you fortunately didn't get to see that too gory, and Ben Vernon from San Diego Fire Department, who was slashed three ways by a bystander who thought he could contribute medical advice to Ben as a paramedic's treatment of a drunk homeless person. So this was a bystander who took a knife and started slashing at these responders. So we had them there to make sure, it's called the BS card, I won't explain it because we're being recorded, but to let us know if it was actually going to work for the boots on the ground. So a systems level checklist, if it sounds like Swiss cheese, where am I? Not there yet. Did I miss it? All right, I moved the slides around a little bit. Okay, so the purposes of, of a systems level checklist, and I'm not aware of this being done anywhere in any industry, is to take the onus off of the worker for being responsible for any error that happens in a system and any error or injury that happens to themselves and putting it back on the organization for whom they work. That would be this hospital. That would be the Philadelphia Fire Department and IAF Local 22, who set the policies, procedures, and practices in place that are either create a culture of safety or don't. So if this sounds like Reason Swiss Cheese, how many people know Reason Swiss Cheese? Everybody look around. These are the most important people in the room right now because these are the people who have been trained to think about taking our focus off of the worker and onto the rest of the organizational structure. So I'm gonna skip ahead in some slides because I have it here and I'll go back and forth, so don't get nauseous. Okay, so this down here is where we focus. This is the basis of our medical malpractice system in the United States, right? Blame the worker, blame the physician, blame the nurse, blame the pharmacist, where's my pharmacist? Blame, yeah, you're gonna get that, you're gonna get blamed too. Let's blame the last person who touched the patient. But as our pharmacy policy, po colleague can tell us here, there's 100 steps between ordering a medication and getting it to the patient, right? So really, we're gonna blame the nurse? Really? Okay, that is ignorance of the fact that we work in a highly complex system with a lot of technology, a lot of moving parts, a lot of sociological things to consider. So what reason tells us is to think about the system and to think about upstream factors like policies, procedures, and practices, like regulation, like training, like communication. 
No individual nurse or physician is responsible for all of that. Well, maybe maybe you are. Maybe you maybe like people at the Value Institute, you wear five hats and get one paycheck. You know, it, it happens in organizations. But the thing is, we need to be looking upstream, right? That's what this systems level checklist does. It looks at what is the organization doing to have the backs of the first responders. So. So we read all this literature, hundreds and hundreds of articles. We built a draft checklist. We brought these people together. And we thought about the patient care episode in EMS. And so we thought about that what's, what's listed here is on the call is what you do, right, as a, as a paramedic. The tones go off, and you're traveling to the event. You're getting information from dispatch, and then you're going to go do patient care. Well, there's a missing link we identified. And that is the very structure of the organization. That is the policies, procedures, and practices. This could take the form of your mission statement. It could take the form of zero tolerance policies. So an example of something that might be in a checklist at this level. Let's see if my animations are going to work here. They might not. Nope. OK. So in the pre-event phase, pardon me. Should have practiced with the technology first would have made for a more smooth presentation. I know you're thinking it, and I'm thinking it too. So in the first phase, if you can focus on the pre-event, this is about the, the structure. And this is where we can start to conceptualize what can the organization do to protect the safety and health of our providers when they're engaged in patient care in the job. So does your department express through policy that verbal and physical violence against providers is not tolerated. Does your department or hospital have part of its mission statement that the safety and health of its members is paramount in order to provide quality patient care and community service? The next, and so there are multiple items in each of these phases. I'm just giving you a taste of each one. Once the tones goes off and the tones go off and paramedics are sent to a scene, they're getting information. So when they're traveling to the scene, is there a flag in the CAD dispatch system that lets them know that the house they're sending them to is a previously known violent location? And then are they being backed up by the dispatcher saying, you are instructed to stand down. We have called for a police assist. They are on their way. Do not leave the vehicle until they arrive. That is very different and very hard for firefighters and first responders to do because they're used to running at top speed. I've seen this in nurses as well. When they get on the scene, does the department have a policy in place for the responders to communicate back to dispatch what they see? If your spidey sense is going off, do you have a policy that says when you'll don ballistic gear or other protective equipment? The next phase is the patient care process. And so the emphasis here is really on de-escalation, when to use restraints, how to transport, and how to check for weapons. So does your department have a policy on assessing patients and bystanders and their environment for threats and have providers as well as dispatchers, meaning the, the supervisors at headquarters and also the field-based supervisors, have they been trained on de-escalation? Do you know how to talk to someone in a culturally appropriate manner? If someone is agitated, do you know how to de-escalate? Have you been trained? Is there policy? The second to last phase is assessing readiness to return to service. So you've transported, you've dropped off the patient at the ER, you've handed them off, you've done your EPCR, you've cleaned the back of the box, and you're about ready to let dispatch know you're ready to return to service. Does your department or your hospital have a policy that gives EMS responders or healthcare providers and supervisors the autonomy to decide what they need physically and emotionally after a call prior to returning to service? And then finally, the post-event phase, which is after you have experienced an assault, 
Have you reported it? Does your department perpetuate a safe culture for reporting so that members will not be disrespected or dismissed for reporting a violent event? So, okay. So, there are 174 items identified as essential by our subject matter experts. And that's a lot for a, for a fire department or a healthcare organization to do, and I'll talk about that in a moment. If I can go forward, let's see. Okay, there were 174. The subject matter experts agreed that 80 of them could be implemented in their fire departments within three to six months. 80 is still a heavy lift when you think about operationalizing policy. So we took those eight and organized them into, it, those 80 into eight model policies. And just last week at Drexel, those fire departments came together with representation from every level, from a paramedic all the way through a leader and a union representative and a dispatcher and field supervisors. And they finessed and adopted these eight model policies, which will be implemented in their fire departments over the next three to six months. Hundred and, so eventually, 80 will be done right away, but the other, the, the remainder of the 174 will be done as they can address the feasibility issues. That's a lot for an organization to do. What does the individual responder have to do? What does the doctor or nurse have to do? In EMS, they have to do six things. If you know Atul Gawande, and his work on checklists, he talks about pause points. Pause points represent here an EMS responder checklist. Pause points give autonomy to the provider to talk back to the system and say, I am here and stuff is going down. I am here and this is not a safe scene. I am here and I need assistance. I am here and I am being assaulted. I am here, my spidey sense is going off. We need to initiate this protocol. I need a moment after responding to a four car crash on I-95 with three dead kids before you call me back into service. And that may take many forms that an individual needs to deal with that traumatic event. Whether it's a traumatic event at that level or just seeing a two-year-old injured because you have a two-year-old at home and that's traumatic for you. There's a whole spectrum of trauma that people experience. This is a time when the boots on the ground can say back to the organization, this policy that you put in place, this training that we didn't have, it ain't working. It's an opportunity to instill in the provider the recognition in high reliability organization fashion that this person is the expert because they're doing the work and they can tell you what works or doesn't. This gives them an opportunity to talk back to the system and say, here's from the field view of things, our opportunity for improvement for us and for safe patient care. And here they are. If you have knowledge that this was a previously violent location, request and wait for law enforcement backup. So they stopped the process before exiting the ambulance are all the resources you need in place to begin safe patient care. Before transport, does your patient require restraint and have they been checked for weapons? The back of the box is a confined space and the driver's in the front and you usually have one provider and one patient in the back. They can be carrying something. Anything that you're using for patient care can become a weapon. Check the patients for weapons. After you have dropped them off and handed them off to your partners in care, are you ready? Are you physically ready to return to service? Do you need to pee, eat, call EAP? Are you physically ready? Are you mentally ready to return to service? And can you tell dispatch, I need 10 minutes or we're going out of service for the rest of the day because we've just seen this mass event and we need help right now. Put somebody else in service. If you've experienced violence, have you utilized, have you reported it? I am an advocate. I am before city councils, Congress, OSHA, always doing these things. If I don't have data, I am powerless for my data geeks in the room. Data are power. People have to report and there has to be a safe culture for reporting. 
that they won't be blamed or shamed for the fact that they experience violence, whether it was intentional or not, because prevention strategies wrap around intentionality. And that's what we know in public health. Finally, at the end of the day, have you sought and received the physical and long-term mental health resources you feel will enable you to return to work whole and ready? These six things appear on the laminated card for our EMS responders. It's all that we ask them to worry about. It is codified in 175 policies that support that decision, that autonomy in the field. The policy work that the organizations do is the heavy lift to have the backs of those first responders in the field. <clears throat> Where we are with this in the US Fire Service is we are implementing this in our three partner fire departments, Philly, San Diego, and Dallas. These are very large fire departments, large memberships, large EMS percentages of 80 to 90%. Wow, I don't know what happened there. And we are engaging, this is not only for Scott, but for everyone in the room, in massive mental health assessments of the providers. So the intervention is at the organizational level, right? But the outcomes are measured at the individual level. How have the policies, procedures, and practices, and the training thereof moved the needle on the level of burnout that these providers are experiencing? increased their job satisfaction and engagement with work, which will give you quality patient care. How are they doing? And that's what we expect to find. We are already developing policies and seeing development of programs around psychological resilience in these fire departments just on the basis of their baseline burnout data, for example. Health communication is a very important part of what a public health practitioner does. And these are some images. We've partnered with an artist who is a paramedic in Canada who, as part of his post-traumatic stress therapy, has engaged in art therapy. And so he paints and digitally creates his experiences and has given us the ability to use these for free because we're working for the fire service. And these are just some of the things we do for a locked down confidential patient safety organization certified confidential reporting system for violence that we're using in these departments. So these are some of our images, pardon the language, but it is the United States Fire and Rescue Service. And indeed, when we looked at the literature, verbal violence is the most commonly experienced form of violence. People don't think that that creates psychological injury. I don't have to tell you that because you have Scott. <laughs> but we're very concerned about people walking around being psychologically injured. And indeed, this has ramifications in policy because many states' workers' compensation, compensation systems will only, I have no idea what's happening, I'm sorry for people watching online, um, many states will only compensate a physical injury. But after the Boston Marathon bombing, I was working with the Boston Fire Department, on April 12th, there was a huge uptick in workers' compensation claims for the department. They were all stress. Okay. I'm going to keep my finger on this because it's, it's got a life of its own. I'm almost done here. This is one of my favorite ones. If you all yelled at each other, it would be an HR issue. Why isn't it in other industries? and especially people who work out in the field. So, I just can't even. <laughs> okay. The last slide has my contact information, but it also has this. And when you click on the slides, there's a hyperlink that takes you right to this publication. This is the checklist we developed for the Fire and Rescue Service. It has not been conceived at the healthcare level for our bricks and mortar institutions. But I hope I've convinced you a little bit in that I know you, you think you're different, and you are. But there are a lot of similarities in your industries. And I'm hoping you're seeing a little bit how perhaps these policies, procedures, and practices aren't present in the hospital industry. And this is community property. You can use it and modify it however you like. Um, if I can get back to that slide and stay there for just a minute, 
you'll notice that this fantastic woman who is part of the Value Institute, Cecilia Harrison, was one of the authors of this innovative organizational level intervention to protect healthcare workers from stress and violence. So we have about 15 minutes left for discussion if that clock is working, which the ones at Drexel never do, so I'm gonna take a leap of faith there. For any questions, comments, arguments, which I invite, or thoughts about how you might move forward with this or how we're gonna move forward with it. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion that results. So, uh, with your um, recommendation, your policy recommendation, the slides that you, you, you know you started with one, so the people are getting a yep. and then you had the slides with the polls. And so, do you know whether the EMS do that now, the EMS uh, uh, workers? Right, so they don't do it now. So, right now, uh, the fire service, as opposed to the, the hospital industry, because one of the core values of nursing is autonomy, right? For my nurses in the room, the fire service does not have that as a core value. The core value of the fire service is shut up and do what I tell you, and no one's going to get hurt, right? Any firefighter family members here, or people who've been paramedics or EMTs, so you know what I'm talking about. So there isn't this kind of be a professional, and if you see something, say something, right? That's not the way they're raised. It's a quasi-military culture traditionally. The only hope that I have for it is that all these millennial people are entering and they ask why constantly and it is the best thing we can do for the fire service. So they're not doing these things. And what we're hearing from them is I show, I get, I get dispatched to this apartment. I have no idea what, what even the medical need is. And I walk in and there's a person with a gun. Like, so who knows what, right? So they don't, they're not getting the information. Before you go into a patient room, you have information, right? Mm -hmm. That you can before you go in, and it gives you something. It probably you probably even have flags if they've been violent or disruptive or have, you know, altered mental states, right? You probably have that in your systems. We don't we don't have that in the fire system. I know you're thinking, why do I pay taxes, right? <laughs> but but the, the the informatics aren't there. So all of my informatics people that I talked to this morning at the Value Institute, they don't have people like you who are thinking about systems integration and what data people need to have. It's very old school. And so, you know, even getting EMS responders to, to, to take that laminated card, which they have, and use their voice is going to be a very interesting process. Because if, the, if their departments don't back it up and say, we want to hear from you, we support this, we're going to train you how to do these things, it's, it's going to go nowhere. Policy is easy, right? Policy fails at implementation, right? So th this is easy. This is the easy part, right? The part now is to actually get the departments implemented, and they've all they've all come together. So they've shared best practices. Dallas has some issues being a concealed carry state, for example. San Diego is on that other coast, and everyone's cross trained as a paramedic there, and they are paid six figures and they are happy to do whatever you ask them to do. Philly, traditional fire department, you know, we put wet stuff on the red stuff. We put on band aids, but we're not really happy about it. You know, so very different cultures to consider, and that's going to, that's why we're excited about having those different structures, because we can think about how the culture helps or doesn't help with the, with the implementation. <coughs> so the staff of um, uh, uh, fire, firefighter nurses ready to go back to work. So what is the onus of Yes, I'm right. I'm ready to go back to work. I can go back to that, I, that can be sure. So compartmentalize. Absolutely. So that's going to get back to work. Be assigned a leader. Yep. So we have to see responsibility for it. Right. So and again, this is a this is a long term vision, right? Yeah. So they're not going to believe when you do this okay. that they really can. That okay. they can say to you. I mean, I just need 20 minutes, so I just need to go into this closet sure. for a little bit. They're not going to believe you're actually going to support that. And eventually, as you support it, they'll see it. And so then they'll start to ask for it when they need it. 
They're also supervisors, right? So in the fire service, there are field-based EMS supervisors who are driving around in an SUV trying to back up their boots on the road. And so that field supervisor should have a good sense, a nurse manager, right? Should have a good sense of where her people are and how they cope, right? Everyone copes with trauma differently. Um, someone yelling at me may ruin my day. Someone yelling at you, you might be like, come on, right? So we deal with it differently. So we have to have flexible solutions. And I know that makes people in leadership freak out, right? You can't make a policy on individual differences. Oh yeah, you can, right? You give people latitude in decision making. So there has to be trust going into the system that when they call for it, they're gonna get it and everybody's gonna be supportive, right? And I've seen this happen, right? I've seen organizational solidarity in the fire service where one person needs something and everybody's like, right? So it's it, it's a bit of a process. Sir. So, uh, Rob, just one of the following safety officers. Um, unfortunately, I think there's a large section of our organization that's not in the screen. Right. It's bad. First question who stopped? Stop. stop. <laughs> and this is how we do the organizational comps, right? So, can this is being recorded, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> What I'm wondering about is, and this is an epidemic problem yeah. in our organization. Um, and what I'm curious is, what was the conversation like about normalization of moving around, like creeping up, and it's kind of like just the way it is. It's Right, and so um, it's very interesting. The study we did with the Philadelphia DA's office, I heard this from every DA and every judge, that it's what you signed up for. It's part of the job. And the workers have internalized that belief for quite well, right? Because there's been no relief now. So when doing this type of work, it is necessary to have a campaign that says, <clears throat> violence is not an acceptable part of your job. It's not in your job description. There's no competency. Right? And so it's starting that conversation about this has happened, we have internalized this belief, and we need to separate it from ourselves. Scott's going to help me do that. <laughs> so that's, that's the beginning. You've got to say it's unacceptable. Okay, Who's in charge? You're going to modify Scott. But you, you've got, you, and again, sharing those stories, especially with your board of trustees and your, and your big you know, C-suite leadership. To have somebody who is highly respected here talk about their assault, to have images. I have firefighters texting me bite marks all the time, right? All kinds of stuff that they experience. This is real. There are things we can do about it. And as an organization, if I may just bring the post shift back to this conversation for just a moment. As an employer, there's the general duty clause of the OSHA Act of 1970. You have a responsibility to provide a safe and healthy work environment. And an OSHA standard has just been released on this issue. And this checklist is being considered as a best practice. So if you want to really get ahead of the curve, Christiana and Value Institute, right? you're going you're gonna to look at this and see if you can fit test it for you guys, right? Please. So just to follow up, let me yeah. try to ask my question a little bit different. I, I haven't said uh, answer. Yeah, um, I clearly accept the organization's responsibility for providing a work safe workplace, um, as well as training, educating, helping policy. What we see in some of our events, however, is that there are early warning signs that we have. They still move towards it instead of going to a more Again, I think part of that's lack of policy, lack of support. I understand the underpinnings, but how did you, with this type of work, broach the, uh, the individual person's awareness that they're actually getting into trouble yeah. and they're not doing it? Yeah. Campaign number two, slow down. It's very hard to tell a nurse to slow down. They don't need sleep or pee. I know. I've seen you. And you just, you'll just work, work, work. 14 hours is nothing. Right? Slow down. Right? We've got, we've got to get people to slow down. That's a part of the campaign. Is that this is this is not normal. It's your normal, and they've internalized this. 
what's a breakthrough? What's a great help? I know that in general people care about conditions that do not. Careful. And Lucian Leap says that worker safety and patient safety are an extra. That's the way you want to solve this problem. So it's Quite sure that's how I'm going to get some extra money in the fire services. No one cares about the EMS workers, but when we say that patients aren't getting what they need, then people are going to start paying attention. I'll play any game that I need to. But you need to have them slow down. You need, to you need to recognize and own, and you need to have people willing to speak about how I internalize this thing <coughs> that that patient kicking me was something I did in my fault because I'm not a good nurse or a good pharmacist or a good aide or a good housekeeper or whatever. It starts with the discussion of what, what it is. Yeah, yeah, yep. So this is, and um, again, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is train, right? You can't, you have to train people how to talk, right? How to slow it down. So I'm sorry. So this part has been about policy, and these eight model policies are going to come out. But afterwards, we have to develop an evidence based training curriculum. And it's going to be something as stupid as getting people to say, I'm sorry. Wow. Let's think of someone else. Rob, I, I, I'm just, I can't. I, I mean, come on, I can't have a moment. And just, just like you do with disclosing medical errors, right? Have you ever practiced that in simulation? Woo! It is hard, right? So practicing it, having a policy that says you can do this, and then actually doing it in simulation so that the next, some, someone has a little bit of muscle memory that when they really need it, because we've simulated, I'm, I'm already comfortable. Right. And so training is really critical. Well, I'm sorry, Marshall, I didn't ask you. Yeah, well, along the same way, you said sometimes people mention that there was just one incident. Yep. Not a, yeah, not so, a right. So this is the problem even with your occupational injuries. You have to report. Do you have a patient safety um, reporting system here? Mm -hmm. Right, what are you using, PSNet, or what are you using? Okay, so, you know, that's what you have for patient safety events. We need the same thing for worker experiences, violent and physical. We're using, we partner with the patient safety organization, actually, who works with the fire rescue service. And so I am a non-compensated employee of them. We created a platform for violent event reporting, physical and verbal, with all of the information that our fire departments wanted. So now, because people aren't reporting. So when I go to workers' comp data in the city of Philadelphia, which I have 10 years of, on average, I get five to 10 assaults reported by members where it's a, it's a lost time injury. When I go to the union, they're getting reports every day. So somebody's not talking to somebody, either because the workers' comp system is gonna to take too long or deny their claim or blah, 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 or it's violence and we're not compensating for that in Pennsylvania, whatever, whatever. So you've gotta get people to report in some way, right, so that you have data. So. In the absence of quantitative data, which is where I am with the fire service, I have some data from the studies I've done, but I don't have national data. I have national data on the level of burnout because I did a geographic strat by brand sick. Right? <laughs> I have it on burnout and job engagement and work satisfaction, but I don't have it on these, these episodes of violence. So I use the words of the providers, I use the images of the providers, and then I share the quantitative I do have. So it's the compelling story, the gross image, and then the data to say, this is what we have. We think this is grossly underreported. You can do that qualitatively to understand the degree of reporting, but you, you've got to get something. And so a, a positive culture, a just culture, right, which is what you're going towards, is going to create an environment where people report. I can tell you on the SAQ, the, the, the survey we used at Hopkins for patient safety, our nurses were reporting stress recognition all over the place because they knew it, they did, they get resources. This is brilliant, right? We had four times that. Right, so, right, so if you have the data, work that data, present that data to every level of influence that you need here. Buddy. My name is Scott. <laughs> <laughs> is that SP? Oh, okay. So using the patient outcome data, Population, 
seems like that's just harder in many cases. Or that's just harder. Right. So, but it, but again, this is this is where the data matter. This is where we know the risk comes from. A patient who's in an altered mental state, right? There are certain medical conditions which you know better than I, where patients become combative because of their medical condition, and so that's 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 where the risk is, right? Now, I can tell you in the fire service that risk can come from anybody, right? Those are just the things. Those are just the common things we can identify. But I just had a colleague whose mother was in the hospital and she was in extreme pain and she, she hit the position. She's totally mentally fine. She just was in so much pain. So again, it's one angle. I'm not saying it's the only one side. I'm just saying that if, if right now your board of trustees, your leadership is all about patient safety because of JCO or you know, National Quality Forum or NDNQI or whatever, go where they are, meet them where they are and start there, but then back up. And again, the workers themselves. Are you unions? <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just asking a question. I'm over up here. Um, but but again, like if there are membership organizations that can be supportive, even unions may be supportive. Even unions. But again, it provides patient care, quality patient care, life-saving patient care. The board of trustees, these sweet folks, it's the boots on the and so. And, and again, nobody wants their hospital staff to not be engaged with work, to not do an awesome job, not to get the best physicians and nurses and physician personnel out there. Nobody wants that, right? But if they don't think about, oh, there's a whole universe of organizational responsibility, we've not really known how to organize to support these things. Well, that's, that's, then there's no, there's no us versus them there at all. It's just, this is what science is offering. Right? This is what our science is offering, right? And so you're already doing checklists. So you're almost there. So, you know, and I'm the president of the Optimist Club, so I mean, I, I do take, <laughs> but you're almost there. All you need now is a checklist for the organization to make sure that the workers are protected. It's an extension of what you do for the patients. It's an extension of the good practices you do in, in clinically, right? It's, you know, all your great discharge planning, all that, that you know, Stuff. All the reporting we do for quality. Yes, me, uh, yes. Sort of building on some of these questions and some of them. But uh, I'm thinking about the concept of burnout to apply to frontline staff. And I think really to make good policy, sort of advocate for okay to end. Absolutely. The narratives are a pleasant example of Chris, you can talk about sort of there are a lot of other frontline staff who like other checklists, other data systems. Oh, we have some other reporting of ours as well because most frontline staff have 2,000 reported an adverse event, like a file of bad patient outcomes, function share, feels like another logistic. May not have actually changed. Not necessarily bad education. Talk a little bit about sort of yes. what has that process better without having any direct buy-in from the industry. Reporting is a part of your job. You don't do more with less, you do less with more, right? You have a period of time that you're on call, and it is trained and a part of policy that reporting, that's what the the fifth dimension of our checklist is it's protected time for reporting. So people don't go back into service till they've entered their assault information, till they finish their EPCR, right? They don't, and, and that's just, and again, I get it. I know what you're thinking, but that we are not machines. We are human beings doing human work. And there's only so much time, right? It's a math problem. Um, analysis trade offs, but I'll give you an example of the, I have online courses that I have to do often. I don't do them, I'm potentially putting my ability to go back to work and get this. So here's a seventh point. Is that equally as important as the others? So I think one of the challenges that it feels like is a lot of policies are being created. Well meaningful. Yeah. But they're contributing to sort of the burnout problem in different ways. 
that that could probably balance those tensions. Burnout from too many checks, checklists is one thing. Burnout from physical and verbal violence is another. Yeah. So, and this is about adjusting priorities, too, right? So when we have something new we have to do, we have to look at what we what's old that we have to do. We have to reprioritize. This happens all the time if you're in administration. What's my priority today? <laughs> right? And it's it's Jayco's coming next week, or it's something else, or we have this major patient safety event or whatever, and, and you just kind of go with it. So again, I'll give you a really good example from the fire service. Um, and this is this is how I'm taking healthcare and teaching the fire service. The executive walk around. Are you familiar with that? Sorry, Connor. Executive walk around is where leadership go around and they elicit safety concerns. They actually do 80% listening and 20% talking. And, and so we've adapted this for the fire service. So people, the fire departments that are developing this with us are like, how the heck are you going to get the chief of the department, the head of the union, and the safety officer to all go around to every station, to every ship in the department in one year? You can't do something else. Delegate it. Whatever. Again, I, I understand that, and time is the end, right? It's, it's what my dad always said: to me, there's never enough time. But what's the priority? If if you, the mission is a safe and healthy workforce to provide quality care, then maybe other things can be negotiated out. Maybe we can have a more humanistic approach to time, where we give people time to think, to react, to plan in their patient's interest and in each other's interest, right? Maybe we engage other people who aren't clinicians to help us. We've got technology people who can make things very easy. Our, our reporting system for violence is super easy. Help with the fire service, they love it. it takes a minute, right? And they can dictate and everything and upload images. So technology can help with some time, but it's all about what your priorities are. And that's a bad answer. But it's it, you got to readjust those priorities. Thank you.